Good evening and welcome everyone to my review fences and uh, our IVF webinar tonight. So, and welcome back to all of you that have been uh, with us before. And as you can see, this is another topic and our special guest. If you've been here with us before, you know uh, Dr. Galina uh, Strako is right here with us and you might be already familiar. So welcome back, Dr. Galina. It's great to have you back. How have you been? It's great that you have joined us once again and we'll present another topic. And you have presented some of the topics on success stories, but this is another topic on genetic um, issues, embryo biopsy. So I'm glad that you will present uh, something else tonight. And how are you feeling? How have you been? Uh, thank you. Fine. This is a great pleasure to be here. This is my third webinar. And I think that today's topic uh, is very, very interesting and quite provocative. I will explain why and hope uh, it will be quite interesting. I have no doubt because, as you've mentioned, this is always controversial, right? I would say that genetics, it's always a controversial topic. So I'm glad that we are talking about it. And I'm glad that there are patients here that are interested in this topic. And I'm sure that you have lots of questions on this particular topic. And, well, I can only... Uh, I, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Kalina will tell you all about it and will have will be happy to not only... Um, tell you a little bit on how it works, but also she will, as, a, as always, she will present some of the cases on this topic and then answer your questions. So remember, uh, we will start with the presentation, but afterwards it will be time for your questions. So if you have any left, if you have any questions in regards to uh, embryo biopsy, PGTA, PGTM or PGTSR, um, you will be able to ask Dr. Kalina and I'm sure she'll be able to help you out. Remember, there is this time uh, of Q&A session right after the presentation. And let me just mention that my IV offenses is a part of European Fertility Society. And we are here almost uh, at least twice or three times a week just to support you, just to give you the chance to ask your questions. And we will be here and we will be happy to help you out in any way that we can. And I know that some of you have been joining us over and over again. And that only means, I guess, that uh, you are finding this interesting. You are finding this um, useful. And we are hoping to be here uh, every, every time that you need something. So I just remember, okay, this is all for you. This is free of charge. And we definitely only want to encourage you to ask your questions. So we will start, okay, on... The topic tonight. I've seen the presentation, it's going to be interesting, I guess, as well. And afterwards, it will be time for your questions. So don't hesitate. It's your time as well. Okay. So go ahead, do it, type those questions in. And let me just mention that Dr. Halina, she's the co founder and leading reproduction uh, specialist at I've Met, which is located in Kiev in Ukraine. And she's uh, been with with us before. This is her third webinar, as she's mentioned. So um, if you haven't seen any of the webinars, I remember that uh, you are always able to rewatch all the webinars with her after we finish as well. Okay, that's it from me. Let's get going. I'm really looking forward to what you have prepared, Dr. Kalina. And well, yeah, let's go ahead, okay, with our presentation tonight. Yeah, let's go. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. So we will start. Yeah, as I have mentioned, the topic um, today topic is genetic issues, and why it is provocative? Because since last ten years, it was thinking that genetic testing on of embryos will resolve all problems of repeated implantation failures of spontaneous abortions of um, not successful IVF treatment, but finally uh, we understand that it is not so easy as it was thought before. And today I will present you the interesting clinical case and then we'll try to um, explain why sometimes the standard genetic approaches may be not so helpful and how we should change and modify these approaches 
and probably it will be the gold standard in uh, next five, 10 years. So let's start. Uh, uh, the clinical case uh, that we will see this evening uh, concerning to <clears throat> my patients of advanced reproductive age. Uh, she come in our clinic when she has 42 years old, uh, 11 years of infertility. Uh, she has one spontaneous pregnancy uh, 12 years ago delivery, healthy baby, but after that was enabled to become pregnant. Uh, she has quite high ovarian reserve, MH was 6.4, uh, she was PCOS patients with normal weight. Uh, her husband has no problem with sperm number count or morphology. And previously she has done uh, one IVF attempt in another clinic. Uh, they receive a lot of eggs, 28 eggs, uh, receive eight blastocysts, has done uh, NGS diagnostic, PGTA, uh, receive only one euploid embryo, cryo transfer, biochemical pregnancy. After that, she decided to change the clinic and that's it. She come in our clinic two years later. Uh, we're discussing with her that, okay, with her PCS uh, ovary will be good to do standard uh, antagonist protocol with triggering with agonists, which prevent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, but from the other hand, necessary to receive as minimum 20, 30 eggs because on low blastocyst formation rate and low... Uh, euploidy of her blastocysts. So we have done the standard protocol with 225 FSH per day, and we receive quite big number of eggs, 50 eggs. She has no any hyperstimulation, mm, it was fine, no liquid, uh, no pain. Uh, fertilization was done with ICSI. We receive 11 blastocysts from all of these eggs and for euploid embryo was very good. And we start to do the preparation for cryo transfer. So first protocol was standard replacement hormonal therapy, six milligram of estrogens and micronized progesterone, 600 milligrams by vaginal way test, unfortunately was negative. Okay, we decide to do second protocol with natural cycle with triggering with HCG because on some time a natural cycle can give more natural level of hormones, better progesterone level, uh, better functioning of corpus luteum. So we modify our protocol, I'll follow her uh, growing follicle, then HCG triggering ovulation and from the day of ovulation we start the support of luteal phase with 400 milligrams of progesterone. Test was also negative unfortunately. Uh, natural cycle protocol was the third, absolutely natural without HCG. Uh, the same uh, progesterone 400 milligrams by vaginal way and unfortunately one more test was negative. So we has no any more the normal uh, euploid blastocysts and we decide to do the second stimulation. So uh, in this moment we receive the new uh, gonadotrophin, folytropin delta. The um, main uh, interest of this medication was that we can calculate the dosage individually uh, according IMH level and body mass index. And in some cases it gives better result, little bit less X, mostly never hyperstimulation syndrome, better quality of all sides, better blastulation. So we decide to change medication, hoping that it will give better embryological issue. 
uh, with uh, folytropin delta with quite low dose, we receive less X, 34 oocytes, also fertilized with ICSI and receive five blastocysts. Three of them uh, was absolutely not good, type C. Type C, normally we don't freeze because they never give pregnancy. Type C mean a uh, low number of cells. And only two more or less good quality blastocysts. NGS test show that no alkaloid blastocysts. Total disaster. So patients decide to, uh, to do the third stimulation. So... Uh, we discussing with her that, okay, she has good ovarian reserve, so we can expect to receive quite a lot number of eggs. Uh, but uh, as she has high level of aneuploidy, um, probably necessary to modify the embryological approach and probably trophectoderm biopsy, which we are doing for NGS testing, may be a factor uh, decreasing implantation potential of embryo. After we will see that in some scientific publications, uh, they after say that trophic to their biopsy may be sometimes harmful. And also we decide to do the transfer of her embryos in totally natural cycle because also, it may be better endometrium quality, recept receptivity, and also wider implantation window. So, we are moving to the third protocol, the same dosage, because first time we received a good number of eggs, trigger with agonists, we receive 49 oocytes, and decide also to do piezo activation after ICSI procedure. Uh, in previous webinars, we discussed that it may be sometime the method which can improve the um, cleavage and blastulation rate because uh, this, uh, this increase the um, concentration of calcium inside of oocyte. And we know that calcium may improve uh, and need for um, good uh, cleavage and good fertilization. So we receive nine blastocysts uh, and decide to do non-invasive PGTA to avoid uh, the influence of trophectoderm biopsy. Unfortunately, we receive only one euploid blastocyst. It was really a little bit not expected, but Anyway, we decide to preparing our patients patient to, to cryo transfer in natural cycle. And finally, we receive uh, after all these attempts the positive test. And you can see the photo. Her, she has not only the test, but uh, pregnancy. Uh, two weeks ago, it was uh, six weeks of pregnancy. So uh, what I would like to talk in uh, after this case. From one hand, we are know that uh, maternal age uh, unfortunately influence the human embryo uh, aneuploidy. It means that after 35, 36 years old, the percentage of aneuploid embryos in increased dramatically. And after 43, 44 years old, most of embryo are abnormal. And that's why uh, mostly all clinics and mostly all doctors uh, propose to patients doing NGS testing, uh, PGTA, uh, for embryos because uh, it may uh, improve the selection and should improve. And really, in some publication, it is written that it is improved the pregnancy rate when we are calculating per transfer. Uh, we can see in this slide that uh, there is three main um, sources of aneuploidy of embryos and uh, paternal part does not change a lot. Uh, 
the problem which occur during the cultivation also more or less stable and uh, represent around 20-30% of all aneuploidy and probably we can influence this part by changing the embryological protocols but uh, the quality of eggs and uh, how to say maternal meiotic problem increasing dramatically with woman age uh, from the another hand uh, last five years appear a lot of publications concerning the technique of trophic to derm biopsy uh, methods uh, influence of laser hatching and i would like to present you a couple of these works so for example um, we can see that trophic to derm uh, biopsy protocol can affect clinical outcomes uh, because, um, okay, uh, there are uh, two main techniques which we can uh, take uh, these cells from embryo. Uh, technique when we first open, I will return the slide, when we open a uh, little hole in embryo day three, and then through this whole part of trophic to derm come out and then it is more easy of course to take this part from the embryo and another method when we don't open like that and taking uh, biopsy when embryo reach the specific stage uh, but when we compare these two methods uh, there are pro and contra and it is very difficult technical issues and for example most of patients and most of doc doctors does not discuss in this question uh, with embryologists embryologists decide okay i will do like that but in most of case nobody know how it was done and according the method how it was done it may uh, increase some uh, percentage of aneuploidy of mosaicism and may influence uh, on blastocyst viability also for example method of opening may give some time a bigger part of embryo passing through this hole and um, also this part may be how to say and embryo may divide after that and give some kind of damages uh, and uh, with this method sometimes embryo may collapse it and after not opening well um, also if we compare mosaicism rate uh, with different method of biopsy we can see that uh, it may be more or less twice difference in mosaicism and we know that uh, sometimes we refuse to do the transfer embryo with mosaicism because we're afraid to have genetic problem genetic disorder but we can see that uh, sometimes the result which we can receive from genetic laboratory may be how to say influenced by technical technical problems technical questions yeah also uh, we can sometime pulling these cells from embryo sometime can flicking and also it may change and may influence the viability of embryo for example you can see in this table that uh, for example method of pulling uh, we have 48% of transferable embryo with flicking 55%. Mosaicism rate in one case it is 17% and another case 9%. So, okay, it, it is quite big differences for me. And especially if patient has only one embryo or two embryo, okay, it, it, it may totally change the situation and in some case we can refuse to do the transfer or patient can refuse having this information uh, because thinking that embryo is not good for example 
so uh, when we are talking about uh, trophic to derm biopsy, uh, should be discussed some critical questions, the timing of zona breaching, uh, whole of uh, this, uh, when embryologists are doing the hatching, smaller, larger, how many cells to take in, 10, 5, 4, uh, pipet size, timing of trophic derm sampling, uh, biopsy method, uh, using laser, time of laser uh, shot, also condition of the washing um, after biopsy, uh, freezing, uh, tubing process. So uh, a lot of questions which can be important for the final result and which are not discussed really uh, during the consultation and even most of patients and doctors does not take uh, attention to all the things. Uh, also interesting uh, publication concerning cellular integrity um, after biopsy. Yeah? For example, embryologists can take cells and all cells are not damaged. Grade 1, grade 2, little damage. 90% are okay. Uh, grade 3, around more than 50% are okay. And grade four, most of cells are damaged. And in this case, we can see that mosaicism rate and an euploid rate may be different between grade one and grade four. Yeah, you can see two time difference. Uh, it is mean that in this case, two time more embryo embryos consider are as abnormal and we will not transfer them. And the same for mosaicism rate. So more damaged cells we have, more uh, embryo considered as mosaic. Uh, also, when we reanalyze blastocyst after trophic to derm biopsy and can see the mm, total cell mass, uh, we can see that around 68% of all embryo give the same result, but it means that 30% of embryo can be different. So, okay, uh, it is the method which can give around 30% of uh, not exact result. Uh, also, uh, Another publication concerning trophic to derm biopsy protocol, which can impact the uh, mosaicism of blastocyst. So we can see the same that some methods give uh, more uh, mosaicism, some methods give less mosaicism. Uh, also, one important thing is that um, sometime when we uh, open in our embryo in day three, we can have trophic to derm cells in this hole, but sometimes we can have uh, part of cells of future embryo in our cell mass. And in this case, also, if we take these cells, it may damage the viability of our embryo. Uh, one more uh, possible problem that for the opening of zona pellucida, in most of case, embryologists using high temperature laser, yeah? And, okay, this high temperature may theoretically influence uh, the viability of cells and cells integrity. In most of publications, it is right and that, okay, it is not very big and important influence, but also it depends on qualification of embryologists, of quality of blastocyst, number of cells, how they are present, etc. Uh, also concerning mosaicism, uh, we should know, and also euploidy of blastocyst, that in most of cases, embryos are mosaic. 
And when we are taking the sample of embryo, we can take sample from this part of embryo and receive like 40% of mosaicism. We can take from this part and receive healthy embryo from this part yeah, and receive absolutely aneuploid embryo. It means that we cannot analyze all cells of embryo. We can take sample and this sample may not be always representative in term on euploidy or neoploidy of total embryo. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, the science uh, moving forward. And uh, last year, the peer interesting method of uh, testing uh, called non-invasive uh, approach. It means that this liquid surrounding blastocyst, which contain DNA, mm, may be analyzed. And this liquid may represent not only uh, cells surrounding uh, inner cell mass, but also some cells from inner cell mass. And it was shown that if embryo was considered as euploid, the probability of pregnancy is very good. If considered as an euploid, normally no viable pregnancy. Uh, there are a lot of uh, embryo which were analyzed by this method. We have quite a lot of publication now. And uh, concordance rate uh, of uh, free cell DNA, it means DNA containing in this liquid and uh, trophic toderm biopsy is quite high, around 80-90%. Okay, it is probably not 100% correspondence, but 80% as for me, it is very good number. And this method uh, not uh, need the invasive procedure in embryo. So in some cases may be really helpful and give quite, quite good information, quite uh, reliable information about embryo. So as a conclusion, I think we can say that PGT uh, it is important tool in IVF practice. It is like gold standard now. Uh, but patients with advanced reproductive age uh, may, from the one hand, have has benefit from genetic testing, but from the other hand, trophic to their biopsy can impact the viability of embryos. So. Um, as we can see, the concordance rate of classical and not invasive PGTA is high. We can think in and recommending non-invasive PGTA as uh, beneficial for patients with low number of blastocysts and with average quality of their embryos. Thank you for your kind attention and I will be happy to answer all your questions. I see that we have yet a question. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Galina. As always, it's been very interesting. Thank you so much for providing the um, the story, the success story, but also explaining how PGTA works, when it's beneficial, and when it should be recommended. Of course, uh, this is, as you mentioned, controversial sometimes. So thank you so much for explaining when and why. And as you can see, there are some of the questions ready. Some of those I do see they are quite detailed right here. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight already. And of course, for your questions. And let's get going with our Q&A session. OK, Dr. Galina, ready? Yeah, yeah, it was pleasure. It was pleasure. Glad to hear that. And of course, um, OK, let's have a look. OK, there's a question for one patient, two parts of this. So let me just have a look oh, at both yeah, of those. Excellent. So can I ask what pregnancy chance I have with two grade one embryo frozen on day three and 41? But I froze the embryos when I was 40. They were not gen genetically tested. Also, do you recommend prolonged use of DHEA and CoQ10? For repeated IVF procedures, does it cause any harm? 
if they can too much. Thank you so much. Mm, thank you. Good question. Uh, there are a lot of little questions inside, so I will try to answer one by one. Uh, so, mm, uh, pregnancy chance I have is too great. Uh, one embryo uh, frozen on day three. Okay. Um, first um, problem that day three embryos we don't know if they will reach blastocyst stage. Uh, okay, one egg and one embryo give uh, around four, six, four, from four to six percent chance to have live birth. So this is probably the average chance with one embryo. Uh, of course, uh, better to see and better to do the prognosis with blastocyst stage embryos. Um, if it is the same embryo and we transfer day three or blastocyst stage, mostly the probability of pregnancy is the same. Only with blastocysts, we are more sure that embryo are viable and has more or less good chances to, to be implanted. Uh, at 40 years old, the average percentage of genetically abnormal embryos are 70-80%. But in your case, nobody knows without diagnostic. Probably this embryo is good, probably no. We, we have no possibility to answer. Uh, in young age, uh, the morphology is correlated better with genetic of embryo and with uh, advanced reproductive age, this correlation is less pronounced. So we cannot say only with morphological uh, description of embryo, is uh, this embryo has chance or not. Uh, we can, of course, do genetic uh, test of this embryo, cultivating till blastocyst stage, doing biopsy, then freezing. Is it really necessary to do? This is a big question because, okay, as we have seen, there are some uh, false positive, false negative results with PGTA. If there is no choice of embryo, as for me, better to transfer and not to do these tests with the embryo. Uh, concerning the pro prolonged use of DHEA and coenzyme Q10, no, there is no problem you can take during a year, two years. No um, publication uh, which saying that it may be the problem, may be harmful, so it may be helpful, you can continue. Uh, so like that. First, on this note, thank you so much, Christina, for your very first question and your help with that. I do believe it has been helpful so far. Uh, actually, Christina has another question. Okay, so let me go to the next question here. Also, I'd like to ask which progesterone supply would you recommend between Dufastin and Lutigest? I heard that Dufastin could increase breast cancer risk if taken for longer periods of time. Is Lutiga just uh, the same and why? Anything you can advise? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, Luit guest, it is probably commercial uh, name. Uh, I'm not sure that I, I know the exact um, what is contained. I will see. Because in each country, uh, the commercial name may be, may be different and probably it is something like Utrogestan, but I don't found. Mm. Uh, will be very helpful if you will um, write uh, Louis Guest, uh, the, the, the chemical name, what is it? Uh, concerning Dufaston, uh, I don't see a lot of articles about Dufaston uh, 
uh, reco uh, saying that it will provoke breast cancer. Uh, from the other hand, if we don't take uh, progesterone, taking replacement hormonal therapy and only estrogens without progesterone in the second phase, uh, it may be, it may provoke the risk of endometrial cancer. Uh, so as for me, if you, you, you can change uh, oral progesterones and oral estrogens if you take in for, for replacement hormonal therapy uh, to transdermal form because oral form provoke the cholesterol increment and uh, better to take uh, by transdermal or transvaginal uh, way. Mm, probably uh, Louis just it is something like trogestan and we can use uh, by transvaginal way. But okay, Nestor that I see, I, I don't, in Ukraine, there is another commercial name. We have no such commercial, commercial name. Understood, of course, perfectly. Thank you so much. Christina, if there's anything else you would like to add, of course, you know what to do. Go ahead, type this in. Um, but I guess, uh, Dr. Halina, this has been helpful from Christina. There's this answer. Yeah, I, I try to find the internet, Louis okay. Gale, but I don't, don't find, unfortunately. I understand. Yeah. Well, remember, Christina, that if you have any more questions or if you would like to get in touch with Dr. Galina, there is a possibility. I would be happy to forward your question to Dr. Galina, her team at I've met, and I'm sure uh, that if they have more questions, if they have more details, they will be able to answer the, this for thoroughly as well, right? So um, I guess that will be possible as well. Thanks so much. But as you can see, um, thank you very much for your answer here. Okay, um, I guess we can have a look at uh, next question from Claire. Okay, so it's a bit of a longer question as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am 41, have had four failed IVF cycles. I am due to have posteroscopy. If no concerns found, I have been advised to have embryo testing. I have three embryos frozen, but it has been suggested to leave those and have another egg collection and test those embryos if I get any. Would you agree with another egg collection and leave the frozen embryos due to the risk of re thawing before transfer? Very good question. Thank you very much. It is really sometime uh, a big question if necessary to thaw an embryo, take biopsy, and then uh, freezing them. Of course, uh, each extra manipulation with embryo may provoke the damage. And of course, it depends on quality of embryos before freezing. If we have um, trophectoderm uh, not uh, with a lot of cells, quality is not very high, more manipulation we are doing, less viable this embryo will, will be after that. From the other hand, we have a couple of publications saying that, okay, we can freeze so, freeze so, and all will be okay. But from the another, we have publications saying that uh, several cycles of freezing and sowing can decrease viability of embryos. Uh, with frozen embryos, we cannot do a non-invasive PGT. So for this purpose, for sure, we should do the new embryos. And the new stimulation also may be helpful because, as I have mentioned, at 41 years old, we will have in average 80% of embryos with genetic abnormalities. So more embryos we will have, uh, more probability that we will have as many one or two with normal genetic. And, and if, uh, as you have seen in my presentation, from 50 eggs at 43 years old, unfortunately we has like one, two, three, Euploid embryos, and for this purpose, as for me, better to do the next, uh, the new stimulation uh, and testing embryos, but discussing by which method, if possible, non invasive, probably, or discussing which kind of technique will be used for um, trophectoderm biopsy. So, like that.
Kim, thank you so much, Claire, for yeah. your question. And Dr. Karina, thank you for, so much for your help with that. And as you can see, Claire has added thank you for your answer to this. And let's have a look, okay? Another question, another detailed question for sure. Yeah, well, uh, Lucy, <laughs> so uh, let's have a look. I am female, nearly 36, never been pregnant before. I have a balanced translocation with chromosomes 7 and 8. My husband's karyotype is normal. He's 36. He, we had two rounds of IVF this year, 34 all signs. 12 embryos, none came back normal. Is that normal? Bad luck. I don't want to consider egg donation. Any suggestion to succeed on a third ovarian simulation? What is the percentage of success if our case, balanced translocation plus, plus 36 of age? Thanks, Amel. And um, much appreciated. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Interesting question and interesting situation. And uh, really mm, difficult to do the prognosis uh, with balanced translocation. Normally, uh, it is thinking that we should have more or less 20-25% of balanced uh, embryos. But from the other hand, we have some percentage of uh, aneuploidy with or without translocation. And also it is very individual. Recently, I had a case with uh, a woman who is also balanced translocation. She has born two normal healthy children without IVF treatment. She has 39 years old. And uh, she came to our clinic with her sister, who has 40, 44, 45 years old. And uh, she was like egg donor for her sister. And uh, OK, we don't expect to have even one normal embryo. She has not very high ovarian reserve. And we received two balanced embryos, normal genetics. So it is really by luck, by chance. Mm, and also mm, the embryological uh, method of working with your uh, eggs, with your embryos, may influence the percentage of genetic abnormalities because it was very interesting publication about egg donation cycles. In some clinics, uh, even after egg donation, the percentage of genetically abnormal embryo reached like 60, 70, 80 percent. And in some clinics, it was like 30 percent. So egg donors, normally young women without genetic problem, and it may be so different depends on um, uh, methods of working, uh, purity of air, uh, medium which were used, etc., etc. Uh, so some practical, some technical things in embryological laboratory. So as for me, uh, you should try uh, probably in another clinic and probably discussing which method of work uh, they they are using normally uh, and try to see uh, what will be with your embryos and which will be the percentage of normal or abnormal embryos. Again, thank you so much, Lucy, yeah. for sharing, but also for your help with this and your advice. Um, and of course, let's have a look. Lucy has added one more question. So what is the minimal recommended time to take CoQ10 uh, by the way. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, it is thinking that as minimum 60 days before you start your stimulation as minimum. But you can take it more prolonged time, like three, four, five months, even more. Mm -hmm. But minimum it is thinking uh, two, two months. So there's days. no harm even if someone is taking it for a few months? Already. Yeah, some people take it for okay. general health because it is antioxidant and right. may increase your energy. So you can take No it. harm in using this even. Yeah, no harm. Yeah, this. Yeah, okay, exactly. perfect. Thank you so much for the clarification in such case. Um, okay, and one more from Lucy. What is the progesterone used recommended for? Uh, for what? Uh, good
good question, but I don't really understand the, um, the question. So mm -hmm. if you are meaning uh, progesterone for luteal phase support uh, uh, in, for example, cryo protocol or in fresh cycle, normally we are using micronized progesterone like progestan or like uh, something like that, close to natural. Uh, Sometimes we can use progesterone uh, in injections, but it is quite difficult for patients to do injections mostly every day. Uh, so, uh -huh. uh, Lucy has added that actually this is a question in regards to this one, yeah? It's re in regard to oh, this question. Okay, okay. So, yeah, in this case, probably better to use micronized progesterone uh, and probably vaginal way is the most, uh, how to say, uh, less harmful. Mm. So we can, we can use uh, this kind of progesterones, uh, but also depends on the purpose for which you are uh, thinking to use the progesterone. If it is for um, luteal phase support, it should be bigger dosage and better always to measuring your progesterone level in blood. Because even some dosage, even some way of taking of progesterone and some body mass, same body mass index may give absolutely different levels in your blood circulation. Uh, and even in literature, we have the term like uh, progesterone resistance. Um, and we are doing that system systemically and around 20, 30% of our patients with good dosage taken correctly has quite low level of progesterone in blood. So this is uh, for um, cryo protocol or fresh cycle, luteal phase supporting. If it is for endometrium problem prevention, we can use much less progesterone dosage, uh, low progesterone dosage, uh, like 100, 200 of, uh, milligram of micronized progesterone during 10 days, second phase of cycle. So depending on what is your purposes to use progesterone. Well, again, thank you so much indeed, Lucy, for your follow-up. Um, and let's have a look, okay? There is another question. So do you offer non-invasive embryo testing? And if not, do you know which IVF centers offer it? Uh, yes, thank you for your question. We are start to offering non-invasive embryo testing. And this morning, just we are talking with... Uh, Mm, with laboratory who propose, who are doing for us uh, this uh, testing, high mm, genomics, uh, and uh, yeah, of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, clinics in Spain, like Evi Clinic, and also another clinic who are working with this laboratory, like uh, Outsource. Uh, I cannot uh, mention you all all this clinic, I don't know, but our clinic, yes, collaborating with iGenomic Laboratory and we proposing this non-invasive test to our patients. Sounds definitely interesting, I guess. So this is something, of course, new, but you are already starting the pro process with this non-invasive um, embryo testing then, yes, I understand. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that sounds great. I mean, iGenomics, uh, might, you might not be familiar, but of course we've been having some webinars with iGenomics already. So uh, this is definitely a promising uh, method. We did a webinar on non-invasive PGT. So this is something that you can, of course, check it out on our website as well, if you are interested. So I hope that this is, um, yeah, it's always amazing to see some new, uh, developments, I guess, as well. Thanks so much, indeed, for mentioning this. Um, okay, let's have a look. There is another question coming up, so might be our final question. So if you have any more, you know what to do. Go ahead, type those in. And Lucy has added, would you recommend DNA fragmentation or more sperm testing too? In regards to the previous question, of course, I can uh, show you that. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, this is from our previous patient, right? So this uh -huh. is the more okay. or less the story. Yeah, um, normally we are doing uh, the um, uh, some advanced genetic testing uh, for our patients, uh, especially with low blastocyst formation rate. And uh, we are doing oxidative stress. We are doing also DNA fragmentation test and sometimes uh, fish test. Uh, we are measuring the percentage of aneuploid sperm cell. Mm, and uh, in case on where found that DNA fragmentation is very high, um, we can propose some specific methods of sperm preparation, uh, which uh, help us to select uh, the sperm cells without uh, less DNA fragmentation. For example, we are using what we call sperm chip, a specific method of selection, and it uh, decreased the percentage of DNA fragmentation around 30-40%, and we have uh, better um, blastocyst formation rate after and less aneuploidy rate also. So yeah, yeah, we are using these techniques. Of course, thanks so much. Um, more questions are coming in also from Lucy, and this is definitely interesting here. Um, so one of our embryo has been diagnosed as high risk mosaic. What are the risks of transferring this percentage of success? Anything you can advise? Uh, yeah, good question. Thank you. And it is also the the topic of big discussion in literature and a lot of uh, controversial publications. Uh, high risk uh, mosaic, uh, it is a mosaic rate more than 50%. But as you, you have seen during the presentation, also it may be sometime by chance, embryologists cannot see which part of embryo uh, was taken and Sometimes these cells, abnormal cells, may be like clusters. And uh, if we uh, are doing the second biopsy, we can consider this embryo as low level of mosaicism or abnormal or normal. So the correspondence, uh, if we do the second biopsy, may be like 20, 30% less or more. So. Okay, we can transfer mosaic embryos. Uh, some problems like uh, Down syndrome or trisomy of 18 chromosome may give after some health problem to children if this embryo will implant. So recommendation that uh, some types of mosaicism not very recommended to transfer. Some of them is more or less safe to transfer. The main problem that mosaicism may increase the um, spontaneous abortion rate. Uh, and if pregnancy occur after the transfer, will be good to do some additional genetic tests to, to this pregnancy, like NIP test or like amniocentesis will be even more uh, information with this uh, technique, so like that. Lucy, thank you so much for your question, indeed. And there is a follow-up, okay, uh, Dr. Galina, so let me go straight yeah. to that. It was 46 chromosomes, I guess. You can see the details. I'm not really sure here. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, but um, how to say, what is the question? This you is see? the description of, um, of, some, of something, but... Um, of course. Let's wait. Someone is typing. Question. <laughs> Okay, this was the description of the high oh, mosaic like, embryo. Okay, 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 I understand. Yep. Okay, I think uh, you can transfer this embryo uh, 
it is not uh, 21st chromosome, not 18 chromosome, uh, but uh, if pregnancy will occur and will be viable and after uh, 16 weeks, you can discuss with your doctor probably the procedure of amniocentesis uh, and uh, it is quite safe and you can receive the um, whole, uh, whole uh, 24 chromosome information uh, and see some additional tests, even some molecular uh, genetic tests, so some mutations. Uh, so you can do all um, possible examinations with these genetic materials and uh, it, it is quite safe and a lot of information which you can receive so i think you can transfer your embryo thank you so much indeed uh lucy is there if there's anything of course go ahead thank you so much uh there's an answer thank you very much for all your advice well couldn't agree more thank you so much indeed and i believe that might be our final question very straightforward question in non-invasive non sorry pgt just is it possible just uh, in uh, is it possible in blastocysts or how does it work? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. This is only possible in blastocyst and better to do um, six day blastocyst. It is more um, more exact uh, with uh, more advanced blastocysts, so not five day but six day blastocyst stage. And uh, it is impossible to do with frozen embryos. We cannot thaw in blastocyst stage and give the result of this test. Necessary to cultivating the blastocyst and all this liquid should be used for, for the test. Uh, not with previously frozen embryos without test. Okay. Definitely. Thank you so much. Well, uh, this is definitely interesting because I think that in recent times it has been something that uh, it's been talked about, but not many clinics were like, okay, we will start doing this. So it's definitely interesting that it's something that might actually, um, the clinics might be offering this, I guess, more and more. Uh, it looks like it. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Clinics, uh, clinics searching the new possibility for their patients, and it seems it seems that non-invasive PGTA may be helpful for some category of patients. Okay, we will see that with more statistics, more cases, but it seems it is interesting and quite promising. And it's worth to check for sure. Lo wo worth to look out for as well, I guess, right? Okay, sorry. Sebastian has asked one more question. So you have to freeze afterwards, right? First, necessary to cultivate, take this uh, liquid material for diagnostic and then freeze. And not opposite. First freeze, then thaw and take and that's all. So first necessary to take liquid after cultivation, during cultivation, because... DNA pass uh, from embryo to this liquid and only uh, and should be some exposition, how to say, yeah, necessary to have some concentration of DNA inside. All right, thank you so much for additional question and of course for answering that, I believe it has been helpful. It might have been our final question, but of course, remember, if you have any more, you know what to do. You can get in touch with Dr. Galina, her team at I've Met, and I'm sure they will be happy to help you out with some more details. Um, definitely more details, because as I always mention, this is definitely a good opportunity for you to ask questions. However, if you need more details, doctors like Dr. Galina, they definitely need more details to answer you properly, to give you more um, details to give you some more advice for sure uh, so get in touch with them and I'm sure they will be happy to help you out so thank you so much everyone for joining us tonight uh, for your amazing questions very thorough very detailed very interesting not easy questions this is all yeah, what easy, we want <laughs> and I'm glad it happens because this this is definitely important for for everyone to to ask how it works right now, how it changes, because it's amazing for me always to see that 
science is there and of course it's developing and it's changing and of course new opportunities show up every now and then and it's great to see that um, they are actually recommended also at some clinics and and it's always great to to see um, those new methods used right so um, thank you so much indeed. Uh, remember, you can always get in touch with uh, Dr. Galina. And also, if you have any questions, you can get in touch with us. And uh, let me just mention that you uh, this has been recorded. So you will be able to, ch uh, you will have a chance to rewatch this again. Uh, Dr. Galina, thank you so much for joining us tonight, for providing this interesting presentation, and of course, answering all the questions. Um, before we finish, is there anything else you would like to add? Thank you so much for your time, for your interest to this very interesting and controversial topic. And if you have any question, don't hesitate to ask him, to write him. I will be happy to answer. And have a good evening, have a good night, have a good week. And hope we will see uh, next time in a couple of weeks. Exactly. I'm looking forward to our another webinar, definitely. I'm glad that you have been able to join us, our team, and you've been able to provide those three webinars before, and I'm already looking forward to some more, that's for sure. Uh, Dr. Galina, thank you so much indeed. Uh, you've been an ex excellent expert here, and well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, everyone, because I know some of those topics are not easy ones, and sometimes I think that uh, asking questions... You think that it's so easy, but I guess it's it's not always the case. Uh, so yeah, as Lucy has just written here, best of luck to all. And I cannot say anything else because we are all here keeping fingers crossed that uh, everything will work out the best way possible for all of you. And, you know, I'm always open to hear some very uh, positive thoughts and positive uh, outcomes for sure. This is actually the, the best time whenever I receive an email uh, saying that uh, something positive has happened and there is a positive test. It's always amazing to, to receive, you know, anytime. So thank you so much. Uh, fingers crossed. The best of luck to all of you. Uh, you know we will be back. There is another webinar tomorrow at 7 p.m. UK time. So I hope you will be able to join us. Another topic, another expert. And of course, I'm sure you have some more questions to ask. So just register, okay? And we'll be here. And uh, thank you so much. Take care, everyone. And see you tomorrow, I hope, as well. Dr. Galina, till our next event, okay? Thanks bye, so much. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye.